Anyone who believes in indefinite growth on a physically finite planet is either mad or an economist. We don't want to focus politics on a notion that involves the rejection of principles around which a large majority of our fellow citizens organize their lives. We are not as endlessly manipulable and as predictable as you would think. The problem, of course, is that the whole system of university finance for English students is sliding slowly but surely off a cliff. The £9,000 fee is declining in real terms. Capital has been slashed. The science budget will have fallen by 20% by 2016, undoing the impact of Labour's 10 years of investment. The system runs so hot that a small misjudgment about student numbers creates a huge hole in the biz budget. So we hear that ministers today were arguing whether to cut research or support for poorer students. The NAO, they've highlighted the black hole of unrecoverable loans. The cost of debt cancellation, the so-called RAB charge, is rising steadily. And the Chancellor's new expansion, apparently based on the same accounting principles as Myrtle's Bank, has many questions about its sustainability. And across universities, you hear pretty much the same thing. We might get through the next few years, but it can't last like this for long. We've already got the world's most expensive public university system, yet most proposals for change actually turn out to be variations on the theme of asking how much more graduates should pay. And that's not the end of the bad news. Now, we've got huge strengths, of course. Our international research reputation is outstanding. We remain a magnet for international students, both the latter, you could say, despite the efforts of the current government. Uh, there's much excellence in our teaching. But concerns about what parts of higher education deliver just don't go away. And many employments remain deeply critical of the employability of too many graduates. Now, one quote is not evidence, but it's not hard to find quotes like this one prefer to be understaffed than hire poor quality applicants. And the CBI have been very strong about this. Businesses are struggling to recruit good graduates from the UK. A mismatch between supply and demand. And with 47% of new graduates not working in graduate jobs, they're in debt and they wanted to get jobs when they went to university. There are some big questions about the links between higher education, the economy, and economic growth. Uh, despite steady progress in widening participation, we're still miles from genuinely meritocratic, lifelong higher education. The change in selective institutions has been small. There's been a sharp fall in mature student applications, a collapse in part-time student numbers, and those are the roots that have previously allowed talented individuals to enter education later in life. And austerity has not gone away. 25 billion pounds of more cuts, says the Chancellor. Now, Labour, too, is going to scrutinize every penny. As a country, we actually spend too little on higher education. But we can't make the case for more money until we've scrutinized every pound we spend. And that's not just the taxpayer pound. The students who went to university this September will, between them, pay £7.4 billion over the next 30 years back on their loans. You can't ask people to pay that sort of money if you can't prove that it'll be well spent. So getting more from current spending is the precursor to even asking for higher investment. So tonight I'm going to argue that billions of pounds of taxpayers' money is spent on higher education, hardly any is spent on teaching students. I'm going to ask what universities would look like if the state actually spent all it could on teaching students things. I'll argue we foolishly turned our back on modes of higher education, which could be better uh, tailored to the economy's needs, more cost-effective, and do more for social mobility. I'll argue that billions of pounds that graduates pay are inflated by all sorts of costs which are not their responsibility, the system lacks transparency, and despite all the talk of choice, is actually narrowing many of the options students used to enjoy. And I'll argue that the current spending does far too little to foster the real partnerships with employers that would benefit students, business, and the wider economy. So I hope that I'll show that we can make changes that will widen student choice, reduce the cost of higher education, and improve social mobility. Let's look at a quick look at the public finance of higher education. That's where we were at the end of the last Labour government. That's where we are now. What you see is, as you'd expect, a decline, but a massive shift between the amount spent on debt cancellation, 
from 17% to 63%, and a massive fall in the amount spent in teaching from 62% to 10%. In fact, of the £6.7 billion of tax-funded spending, just £700 million is spent directly on teaching grant. So taxpayers spend £6 on debt cancellation for every £1 they spend on teaching students anything. RAB charges aren't a progressive policy. They're a simple recognition of the political reality that you can't get blood out of a stone. So according to David Willits, perhaps 50% of this September's students will not repay their loans in full. Think about that. Half of today's students will pay 9% of all of their income above the threshold for each of the next 30 years, and they still won't repay their debts. And that takes no account of bank loans, credit cards, and other debts that mount up while studying. The RAB charge is 28% under Labour's fee system, 32% when the new system was introduced, and now ministers say it's 40%, and many independent experts say it will be higher. It's not just that rising RAB charges are a problem for the government and the public finances, Debt write-off forces up everyone's fees by top-slicing money which could have been spent on teaching. So it's equally true to say that every time the RAB charge goes up, it means fewer and fewer successful graduates paying the debts of more and more economically less successful graduates. That may not be an issue in English politics today, but it will be. Because ever-rising fees will lead more and more students and parents to ask what and who they are paying for. So... There's a problem. If you look at higher education funding, something else may stand out. Look at how many elements were the consequence of introducing a high fee market system. They're either economically unavoidable or politicians had to introduce them to allay public concerns about high fees. High debt cancellation is unavoidable. There was a £150 million national scholarship program which was introduced as the Save Nick Clegg's Face Fund. In one of the largest politically driven programs, the Office of Fair Access requires universities to plough 700 millions of fee income into bursaries, fee remissions, and things of little proven benefit. The maintenance grant was actually increased by Labour and again by the coalition to offset criticism of fees, even though there's little logical connection between the two. Received wisdom might be that touching this spending is politically unwise, but I think we have to dare to think differently. Crude politics has created too many bad policies in the past. So let's take the radical step of putting all the money we can into teaching and then looking at what programs are really needed. As you put more money into teaching, the cost of fees comes down. As fees fall, RAB charges fall, and the percentage of debt repaid increases, so you plough those savings back into teaching, fees fall, RAB comes down, and so on. The effect is striking. In our model, which also builds in some of the other changes I'm going to outline, spending on teaching rises from 700 million to 4.8 billion pounds. The spending on debt cancellation falls by 2 billion pounds. In other words, we have transferred 2 billion pounds from debt cancellation into the education of students. So that's the first thing that happens when you put public funding into teaching, and that alone would nearly halve current fees. But I've explored other changes which do contribute to reducing the cost further, are there in my view because they're inherently desirable, because they give students more choice, uh, they give options to those who don't want to spend three years studying full time, it enables students to reduce their living costs, and it makes it easier for employers to partner universities in the delivery of degrees. So, cutting fees and debt repayment, which is what we've started to do here, uh, will ease the burden on graduates. The more immediate problem for most students is surviving while they study. So, recent NUS research shows a £7,000 gap, typically, between the student living costs and the maximum income that students can get from grants and maintenance loans. There's no prospect of finding the sort of public money that would make a significant impact on student incomes. The only way is to give students more choice of less expensive modes of study, whether that's studying more intensively, mixing part-time and full-time education, combining work and study, or studying from home. But we seem to be going in the opposite direction. I think even the most fervent advocates of Labour's 50% target 
would surely be surprised that it's been achieved almost entirely through the most expensive mode of higher education, the three-year degree studied away from home. Part-time education is collapsing. The number of two years honours degrees has barely changed. Labour's employer-backed degrees have been dropped. Fewer mature students are applying. We're getting a one-size-fits-all approach. It's almost a rite of passage for young people, defended as much for the so-called student experience as the quality of education. No one suggested open university. Graduates don't have real degrees, even though, by definition, they go without the entire student experience. And there's a second reason for challenging our ever-growing reliance on the three-year degree studied away from home. Of all the OECD countries, and I'll go through this quickly, see right at the far end there, of all the OECD countries, the UK has the highest percentage of young graduates. And this was before the fall in mature and part-time student applications. 90% of today's full-time students at university are under 25. So we've made higher education a one-shot deal for young people to do as quickly as possible. What on earth have we done? Our school system fails more than most in overcoming inequality and social disadvantage by the age of 18. 19, yet on top of this inequitable school system, we've actually imposed the youngest higher education system in the world. It's impossible for all young people to compete fairly in such a system. Now, I don't think we should give up trying to persuade the Russell Group to take admissions seriously. I think we should support Alan Milburn's efforts to open up the professions. We should challenge the abuse of interns. But for the foreseeable future, a genuine commitment to social mobility will require the construction of routes for late developers, those who went to weaker schools, and those whose parents had low aspirations. So I've looked at, in my thought experiment, at the role of more intensive degrees, studying from home, and combining work and study. Two-year degrees exist in both the public and the private sector. The private University of Buckingham repeatedly tops the National Student Survey for student <coughs> satisfaction. We can't know the real demand for two-year courses, but research for Kaplan, or be it an interested party, suggests an untapped market and a good awareness of the pros and cons of intensive study. It certainly looks as though some students could study more intensively. David Willett says that students study five hours a week less than in the 1960s. On average, students study for 30 hours a week for 30 weeks of the year. We have the lowest level of study time against most other European countries. HEPI and WHICH also looked at enormous variation between institutions, even on the same course, about the number of hours that are spent uh, studying. And again, according to HEPI, when you put European students on the Erasmus program, they tend to regard studying in this country as less demanding than in all other European countries. So I've suggested that perhaps 30% of courses, half of them employer co-sponsored, could be taught intensively. Now, in my model, I've assumed that a two-year intensive degree, say 39 weeks of study, would cost 20% less to deliver than a three-year degree, and that's based on current public and private sector charges. But I've also set out to graduate the same number of students as we do at the moment, three two-year co cohorts every six years rather than two three-year cohorts, if you like. So at any one time, same number of graduates, at any one time, the teaching costs are 7% less than at present. There are 10% fewer students in the system. But as you'll see in a moment, I've run the system so that cash income to universities remains the same. So we have fewer students at any one time. We have better staff-student ratios, less pressure on facilities, more resources to focus on quality. There's absolutely no reason why standards should fall. Is it won't be for everybody. Intensive study will require commitment and a maturity of approach, which actually makes it perfect for the somewhat older student with work experience who needs a route into higher education but doesn't want or can't afford a leisurely three-year degree. Now, I've also looked at studying from home. In our model, the public finance effect of more students studying from home is relatively small, and certainly not enough to justify taking choice away. My real motive in raising this issue is to challenge the lazy assumption that it does not matter if vast numbers of students have to leave home to study a suitable course. If anything, the current competitive regime in universities is forcing more universities to trawl a national market for students rather than their more local communities. 
The effect of that is to impose a quite avoidable cost on students, which inevitably hits the poorest hardest. And in fact, a new social divide is opening between those students who can only afford to study from home and those whose family gives them the choice to study away. So should we should give students a real choice because it's much cheaper and is the only realistic way of bridging the gap I showed you earlier between the maintenance system and the real costs of studying. We can't make students study from home. Many couldn't for personal geographical reasons, but we are a densely populated, largely urban society with many universities, and there's also, not shown on here, a network of FE, HE colleges which are already delivering respected degrees. It should be possible to offer the vast majority of students a real quality choice of courses within the reach of their own home. And I think it's a scandal that that often doesn't exist and that universities in the same locality barely talk to each other. I've no illusions about how challenging this is. On the one hand, it would be a big cultural shift in the way many young people and their parents see university education. It would be an even bigger cultural challenge to universities because it would actually mean, heaven forbid, suggesting they sat down together at local or sub-regional level. Couldn't we challenge universities to change their insular attitudes? Now, finally, let's look at the end product of all this higher education. Now, of course, university education is not all about getting a job, etc., etc. But, you know, for many students, the idea of getting a decent job is probably in there somewhere. The ONS figures tell us that nearly 50% of new graduates and a third of those who graduated five years ago don't work in graduate jobs. Things have got worse since the recession, but they were not great before the banking crisis. These figures don't tell us we're educating too many graduates. They do show that producing more graduates doesn't automatically increase the demand for graduates. The drivers for that lie elsewhere in the economy. But they also tell us that employers are not wrong when they say that many graduates lack the employability which would make them want to employ them in graduate jobs. So my final proposal is to subsidize employers to put their employees, current employees or potential students they recruit, through university. And I've aimed for 50,000 a year. That's half the total number of intensive two-year degrees. And I'd base this, and I won't go into the detail now, but on the workforce development program I introduced when I was Secretary of State, which actually created, after just three years, 20,000 employer co-sponsored places with employers paying wages and an average of £3,000 towards the course costs. Employees and universities work together to design the courses, Big companies can do it for themselves. Smaller companies might need to work together, but this is something that could well be done locally under the umbrella of a local economic partnership. So the approximate financial impact of proposals uh, shows, and I'll just, you just have to take my word for it because I don't have time to go through it, shows how by putting these elements into teaching, we actually reduce the RAB charges, we feed the RAB charges back into teaching, and the ultimate effect is to put three and a half billion pounds through into teaching. The next slide shows that in the model, we have kept public sector finances at exactly the same level. And the final slide, if you look at the bottom, allowing for rounding errors, shows that we have managed to keep the institutional income of universities unchanged. So there are no cuts here, for university spending, but a more efficient and more effective system. Not shown on this is the £700 million that's currently mandated by offer to be spent on fee, remission and bursaries. I don't believe that most of that money is justified or effective, so actually if you free universities from most of that obligation, you could take the total university available funding to £10.1 billion, a significant amount of money. Let's not overstate the case. You'd still want the more selective universities to invest in widening uh, participation. And there's actually a quirk in this model, which in a few years' time, never, never land or beyond the end of the next parliament, as we call it in politics, you need to invest more money to keep your student numbers the same. But nonetheless, it ought to be possible both to invest in teaching capacity and free up money for research. The model's got a lot of flexibility in it. Um, it's not a final model for higher education. You might think that uh, I've been over-optimistic about home students, too optimistic about employer contributions. I've set a student premium too low. We can 
change the system in lots of different ways to explore variations in how it works. I've pushed change as far as I can, partly to show what's possible and partly because I think it's essential to free up resources for research if we possibly can. Now, how do we deliver this system? And let me just take you through the final stage. We could deliver this system in different ways. I think we need a fresh start, which is clear, which is transparent, which is fair, and makes a radical break with both the current system and that left by Labour. So I'm going to suggest that every student accepted on an honours degree course attracts a flat rate student entitlement which goes to their university. Flat rate, irrespective of institution, course, length of course, or current fee level charged. So you take the 4.7 billion pound teaching grant I've now created, you top slice, as you do at the moment, the extra money required to fund science and engineering and other high cost courses, and then you divide the rest amongst the students. In the simplest form, this produces a student entitlement of nearly £15,000 per student. The fee that is now payable is the difference between the current cost of the course and the student entitlement. That fee would be financially paid back as at present. The total cost of a three-year degree, currently which would be £25,000, would fall to less than £10,000. The total cost of a two-year degree would be less than £5,000. For those on employer-sponsored courses, there would be no student fee and they'd have a wage as well. There are many different routes through this system, but if I illustrate two, take a student living away from home, so that's the most expensive option, on a three-year degree. The fee loan they need falls from current 24000 to 97 Total loan, including maintenance, falls from 39,000 to nearly 24,000. You have a huge increase in the number repaying in full, but the amount that's repaid back over lifetime is substantially lower. Take a two year degree, again, perhaps unrealistically, I've assumed this is studied away from home, so you don't think I'm cheating on the maintenance costs. 84% of people would repay their loans in full but you've more than halved the cost of getting a good honours degree. Students get a lot of choice in this. Money follows the student, but it's an entitlement, I would say, not a voucher. It's time we set aside, I think, the fad that says that every public service reform has to be expressed in the banal and vacuous language of consumer capitalism. If my proposal would be adopted, it would be because the people of England had decided to establish an entitlement for their children. I don't believe the offer mandated money gives you value for money at the moment. I just want to touch on a couple of brief things. Firstly, million plus have been arguing quite persuasively over the last few days that what's currently called the Student Opportunity Fund to support students who need extra support to get through higher education should be retained. I suggest we do this, but I suggest we do it by adding a supplement to the student entitlement, a student premium for those students, and I've modelled that at about 15%. And so you don't think I'm deceiving you. I've also replaced the student grant with a loan. That might sound a bit odd, because obviously that pushes up the amount that low-income students have to borrow. But actually, if you follow the, the red line there, that's what students would borrow at the moment. And under our model, that's what they would borrow in the future. In other words, because fees have come down so much, low-income students have just as much money to live on as they do at the moment, but they will end up owing less than they do at the moment and paying back less than they do at the moment. So just a few closing remarks, because I've covered a lot of ground. George Osborne, in the autumn statement, said he's going to have 60,000 new students and all the rest of it, 700 million pounds he's going to start with. We can't model it because he hasn't given us enough information, but I can tell you if you had 700 million pounds and you spent it through my model, you would get just as many graduates and you'd have money left over for research as well. Just a couple of other things and that's it. We've cut private repayments by 2.4 billion pounds for a cohort of students. I wanted to cut the private cost of higher education. We've actually, though, significantly cut the repayments made by the wealthiest graduates. It's not part of my model, but if you wanted to introduce a freestanding graduate tax so that the wealthiest graduates contributed more, 
perhaps in a hypothecated way to higher education. So, Secondly, part-time fees would tumble. No one's going to charge more for a part-time degree than a full-time degree. And so you'd see a renaissance in part-time uh, education. Well, what happens now? People keep asking me, is this going to be Labour Party policy? This is very crude, this model. The approximations are huge. Uh, the assumptions are broad. It's a de not a detailed plan for higher education, and it's no state to go into anyone's manifesto. And we've had too much damage by done by politicians working on the backs of envelopes already. What I would say was, wouldn't it be good if Biz now put this into their sophisticated models and showed us how this would really work? But that would take ministers who don't feel personally or ideologically wedded to the current system.